Please remember to like, subscribe, and rate on your favorite podcast platform. Trigger warning. This podcast contains discussion of emotional, physical, and sexual abuse, and includes explicit language. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. Whose who's shame is it? Hmm. Why, why is it my shame or your shame? Right. So why, why am I carrying it? This is what was done to me. Right. I have borne the consequences of it. So why should I feel ashamed? Yeah. Yeah. Without healing, traumatic experiences can have an enormous impact on defining who we are and who we will become. Wade Robson and myself, James Safechuck, are both survivors of childhood abuse. In this podcast, we're talking with survivors, trauma specialists, and advocates. Highlighting the many resources available in order to inspire the brave steps to starting or continuing the healing journey. This is From Trauma to Triumph. Hey everyone, and welcome to the From Trauma to Triumph podcast with myself, Wade Robson, and James Safechuck. Today, we have an amazing guest that we're super excited to chat with, and his name is Dr. David Lisak, and he's a clinical psychologist a founding member of the One in Six Board of Directors and a retired associate professor of psychology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He's worked with countless child abuse survivors, studied the long-term effects of childhood abuse, and his research has been published in several prominent journals. Dr. Lisa currently serves as the vice chairman of the One in Six Board of Directors, assists in clinical program oversight, and leads the Bristlecone Project, which is one in six's interactive library of male survivor stories. Dr. Lisak has conducted workshops throughout the U.S. and internationally, and he also consults widely with universities, the U.S. military, and other institutions regarding sexual assault prevention and policies. David, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure. Personally, I'd love to, you know, get to know your personal story a little bit more first. And I think it might be really nice for our listeners as well. So in any way that you want, um, if you just want to kind of move through what feel like to you, the major kind of bullet points of your, your life story. Sure. Start with the easy Uh, question. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's important. It's important. You know, we're, uh, we're all just human beings and um, the things that shaped us um, are the things that are important to know. Uh, uh, my mother um, <clears throat> was a, a refugee from the Nazis, um, got out of Austria um, in uh, basically New Year's Day, 1939. And I grew up surrounded by the Holocaust. Uh, so it wasn't just my mother, but uh, other family members, uh, friends, teachers in my school, uh, you know, so I had this, I grew up with this idea that the, the world is a scary place. You know, <laughs> one way or another, that was going to uh, help to shape me at least. And my mother um, needed to find a way to support my brother and I, two young kids. And so she um, decided she's going to spend a year in a teacher's college, you know, commuting every day. And she needed somebody. I was five, so I was in, in kindergarten. So I was in school half a day. My brother was two years older. He was in school all day. Um, so she needed somebody to take care of me for that sort of the afternoon part of the day. And um, and and so she um, kind of hired this uh, man to come in and he lived in our house. Um, it was it's a tiny little apartment. We were very poor. Um, and But she, she chose him because he was a refugee from the war as well and she was trying to help him out. Uh, He had been uh, interned uh, in a concentration camp by the Japanese in in what is now Indonesia. 
Um, so he was another traumatized refugee from the war. Um, and and he, uh, he's the man who, who sexually abused me and terrified me, terrorized me for, you know, I don't really know exactly, but somewhere around two to three months uh, in the fall of 1959 when I was five. Okay. Um, and that, um, that did shape my life, um, you know, both directly and indirectly. Um, and it, it um, no doubt was the primary reason why I eventually went into um, psychology, became a clinical psychologist. And, um, and it's, you know, from very early on in my graduate career, I was focused on trauma. Um, yeah. and, and that's been true for you know, my entire professional life. You know, I, I did confirm a lot of the, the sort of at least the skeleton of facts um, from my mother um, before I told her uh, what happened. She, she did not know anything about what happened to me at the time, and she only learned about it 30-some um, years later when I disclosed to her. What age were you able to talk to? Did you talk about the abuse right away? Oh, no, I, um, so I was in graduate school. I was in my early thirties, about 33, something like that. Um, for years, I had absolutely no access to the memories. None. If you had asked me my, you know, the first two years of graduate school, when I was already beginning to start working in trauma, if you had asked me, um, you know, did anything ever happen to you when you were a child? Traumatic? No. Okay. Were you ever sexually beaten? No. You know, absolutely would have earnestly, honestly told you absolutely not. Right. Um, and of course, <laughs> this is the challenge of <laughs> trying to <laughs> trying to do this kind of research with men, especially. Yeah. You know, that, that is such a common thing. Um, so that all, it all came very dramatically, I was, um, I mean, I was a mess mm -hmm. in, in many, many ways. Um, and I was uh, in four times a week psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I came in one afternoon um, and I'd had a dream the night before. Mm -hmm. And I started telling her the dream. And just like that, it's like the wall cracked and started falling apart. And I knew it. I mean, the memories just flooded in. Uh, was, was the dream memories of the abuse or no? All it was was this little girl in the dream was wearing a helmet. And I, I, had, I was very concerned about the little girl. And... Um, and so finally, uh, we, we sort of get close enough that I can ask her, are you OK? And she looks at me. And that's the end of the dream. Mm. This little girl in a helmet looking at me. And so when I got to that part of the dream, when I was in the analyst's office. It re I realized, wait a minute, the helmet, she wears the helmet because she bangs her head which is a common thing in kids who are really distressed. Right. You know, just banging their head mm. against something. And then I remembered I used to bang my head. Mm. Oh, wow. And in an instant, I realized she's me. Mm. Wow. And in the same instant, I realized she was sexually abused. Mm. And in the same instant, I realized I was sexually abused. Wow. And then the the they just the, the memories just poured yeah uh, so it wasn't like i had to you know who could have sexually abused me no, all of it came back i remember peter i remember you know again fragments yeah. but a lot of enough fragments to you know to piece together what what had happened wow. and then and then there have been more yeah. over the years right so you have been you know you've had your own trauma and you've been you know been in treatment dealing with it you know, for a while, do you think 
survivors of child abuse tend to have misconceptions about what the healing process looks like, where they should be, or, or what that actually plays out like in, in real life? Well, I, yeah, I do. And I, I, I think, you know, the longer I have lived, um, the more I have not just seen, but, but I've, I've sat with so many men who have suffered trauma um, that it, it is, you know, kind of slowly become clearer and clearer to me that, um, and I, I think especially our mental health establishment has um, a very narrow view of what healing is. You know, when you start down that road of, you know, we need to uh, study systematically, you know, what is trauma? How does it affect people? How do people, you know, get better from trauma from their, you know, how do they, how do their symptoms, you know, sort of improve over time? What are the kinds of treatments that will help people with that? You know, you have to break things down into, you know, sort of little measurable quantities. And, right. and so inevitably what, what primarily happens in psychology and psychiatry is, you know, so we, we um, come up with this concept called post-traumatic stress disorder. All right. And, and it's a concept, right? It's not a thing. It's not, can't find a molecule of it. Um, it's our way of conceptualizing. And it's a, it's a pretty good way. You know, it, it really does map on fairly well to a lot of people's experience. But then, of course, we have to measure that. So if, if you, you know, <clears throat> are, are traumatized and you're having certain symptoms, then we want to know, well, do you have this thing called PTSD? Um, mm-hmm. And in order to meet that label or to, uh, to get that label and therefore to get, get your insurance company to help pay for your treatment and so forth, well, we have to measure the different components of PTSD, right? So are you having intrusive thoughts and feelings and nightmares and are you you know is your are you reactive you know hypervigilant are you avoidant of various things there are all these different categories we have and for each one we come up with ways of measuring it and and so at every step you're you're molecularizing things you know and and eventually you know over time these concepts become reified to become more and more like real, like they really are something you could measure like a molecule. And, and so as a survivor, it's almost impossible not to begin to internalize this understanding of, you know, how trauma lives in you and, and what healing would look like. So for example, if PTSD is the thing that most people recognize as like, that's the diagnosis of trauma, right? So let's just talk about that. Um, so most survivors, many survivors at some point come to the realization, sometimes because they were sitting in a doctor's office and the doctor says the word, right? You know, um, you have PTSD. And, and that could be a very important moment, you know, to realize that, yeah, you know, the trauma is real. And it and the effect on you is real, um, and, and and then you learn about PTSD and the, you know what the symptoms are, right? So one of the symptoms, obviously, is in the one of the big ones are, are are intrusive thoughts, right? Or moments when the emotions just flood you, or you wake up with a nightmare. The logic then is, if you heal, if you're healed, if you're healing, then those things should not happen as mm-hmm. much anymore. Right. right. In fact, you should right. get to a point where they don't happen. Right. That's mm-hmm. that's how yeah. you know that you are now healed up from this trauma. Yeah, James, I can tell right. you, you want to. I know. I, I'm, I'm like this. So pertains to what I like. I'm I'm going through at the at the moment too because you know I've been in therapy for a while and. And sometimes you, you know, when you feel these triggers or when your body responds, it's not something that your brain can control. I can't 
force my brain. You know, it's, it feels like it's just a different part of my brain that I, that I don't have control over. And, you know, you go through periods where you feel good and you're not feeling those triggers and then they'll come again and they'll come again for, for a certain amount of time. And you can kind of get down like, Oh, why am I feeling, why do I continue to feel this pain and this, this body pain and these triggers? And, and I've been thinking about, or in that thought, you can kind of get down on yourself. Like I'm not progressing fast enough or, Oh, I thought I was at a certain point. And then you can, if you get too down, you kind of go back backwards a bit. But I've been trying to think about, okay, I do feel this pain. Okay, that's happening. But my reactions to the pain have changed. So the way that I react to it and deal with it is has improved. So, you know, is is there is there something to that where it's it's okay that I feel this pain and that it's still happening, but there's progress being made because I'm handling it better. The fact that you could just over the last, whatever that was, one and a half or two minutes, you were able to describe that whole sequence and articulate it Hmm. means that you are no longer in the same place that you were, you know, whether it was five or 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, where something like you know, one of these waves would come over you. And, you know, just to stay with that sort of analogy, and it would knock you over, you know, you you would you would not be standing there able to do what you just did, which is Mm. articulate your own inner experience. Right. So you are simultaneously experiencing the pain. But from a position where now you there's a there's a part of you that is 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 not overwhelmed by that experience, but there's enough of you that is observing it and recognizing what it is. Right. And you know, I right. I think that is not unlike. You know, I, I had a brother who died. I, he was twenty. He was two years older than me. He was twenty five. I was twenty three. And so I you know I have grieved him, really for the rest mm-hmm. of my life. But at a certain point, you know, I would be, you know, filled with sadness. I would cry. But it had changed, you know, because it it didn't flood me. I I didn't sort of just descend into, you know, sort of overwhelming grief. I actually felt close to him. Mm -hmm. And it made me really sad because I miss him. How could I not? Mm -hmm. I miss him. You know, but that is a very different kind of grief. In fact, mm. may, I mean, maybe we need a different word, but whatever it is, it isn't the same grief that I experienced when I was in my 20s. And that's that's really the crux of this issue of, you know, how we think about healing is it, it is it's not just the, you know, sort of the elimination of symptoms. Right. Because frankly, a lot of symptoms never get eliminated. They get mm-hmm. changed. They alter. Right. And they and exactly what you just said, your experience of them is altered. Implicitly and sometimes explicitly, the mental health community, you know, has gotten used to uh thinking about the 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 consequences of trauma in terms of these measurable, you know, sort of quantities. Okay, if if those symptoms define the trauma, all right, we know you're traumatized because you have this array of symptoms, then by by logical sort of mm-hmm. sequence, healing would be the elimination of those symptoms. Right. Mm. So when we can say you no longer meet the criteria for PTSD, you know, we give you a ribbon and out the door you go, you're healed, have a great life. Right. Right. And that that's great. And you feel elated. And then, you know, several months later or a year later or whatever it is, you know, you're watching a television program that for some reason just cuts right into you and boom. Yeah. And all of a sudden you're thinking, oh, man, 
I thought I was healed. Right. right. I'm broken. Yeah. Right. right. I'm still broken. But I, I'm I'm way more messed up than I thought because you know I, I I was a fraud. I guess I you know somehow they thought I was healed, but I wasn't. Right. You know. Right. And part of this is you know I grew up with with, with family members and you know who had suffered these horrendous traumas. And, you know, I saw them living, I mean, they were parents and grandparents and they had built businesses and, and done wonderful things. And some of them were artists. And so they were, you know, fully functioning human beings with full lives who at the same time, when they sat around the table and slipped into German, the pain was just palpable. Mm. And those things live together in every human being. Right. And that's the problem with the narrow vision of, of or understanding of healing is as a whole human being, you are able to experience your own suffering and yet more and more you can, James, you can do what you just did a moment ago, mm -hmm. is you, you are not just your suffering. Right. right. More and more, right. you are a, a larger person, a bigger person, a more complex person who can house both your pain and suffering and your healing. You know, I think since people have this idea that when they get better, they're going to be symptom free. That's, I guess that's a tough sort of transition to make or, or a tough realization to make is that getting better doesn't mean you're not going to feel pain. It doesn't mean you're not going to feel those things that, that doesn't mean you're better. It's, it's feeling those things and, and then reacting to them and in, in a healthier way or, or processing them in a healthier way. So I think it's a different sort of mental shift to what we would think about what healing is like. Yeah. That leads me to something else, which is, you know, people's modern idea of what happiness is and what mm -hmm. that goal is. And I, and I feel like that's been corrupted by advertising um, mm -hmm. and you social know, getting media. Into, yeah, social media. It's like, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. people's idea of happiness is this excited, elated feeling and seek and constantly trying to seek that when yeah. that might not be the, you know, the best, the best idea of what happiness is like is happiness contentment or like a, a peaceful calming feeling and, and are your goals for being happy, you know, not realistic. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I've never been a big fan of happiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <clears throat> You know, happiness, I, I think, is something you will encounter um, at different points in your life. Um, and, you know, in, in smaller quantities, different points in the day, in the week. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we are human beings. We're part of a, a species, right? And we are endowed with the capacity to experience deeply um, and experience deeply of everything in life. But life on this planet has never been, you know, like it's never been a garden of Eden. People die, people get sick. I mean, you know, I mean, think about the Buddhist you know, sort of philosophy, you know, um, all of us are destined to experience illness, to experience pain, to experience all kinds of suffering and loss. Yeah. And I, I think health is measured by very simply for me is do we retain the capacity to experience everything that a human being experiences on this planet? Mm. And that means my suffering, uh, my my moments of joy, 
Um, I can experience intense love, but that means I also have to experience the loss of that love, right. grief. Hmm. And if I can do that, then to me, that's health. That's, that's what a human being and a sort of an unrestricted human being is capable of experiencing. Right. Yeah, what you're saying <clears throat> makes me think of, you know, post the sexual abuse that I experienced as a child, you know, not knowingly at a time I went into many, many years of numbing, right? And one of my major um, drug of choice was, was work and was success, right? Um, and so I was just, you know, felt very numbed out for many years and had many amazing experiences in my young teenage life and early 20s and, 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 you know, sad and tragic and scary moments. But I often felt that I wasn't, you know, I would look at people who seem to um, experience full uh, emotion, whether it was extreme sadness or anger or elation. And I would look at them like aliens. How do they do that? What does that, what does that feel like? Um, and, you know, it's turned out for me that post, you know, disclosing and, and, and engaging in my personal healing journey and trying to slowly learn to lean into all of the pain that, that, that pain has ended up sort of carving into me this deeper capacity for joy as well. Yeah, I mean, have you found that as well, both personally and, and in your work? Absolutely. Yeah. And, that, and that's the, the, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, our capacity to to numb ourselves, to like dial down our emotional experience, you know, it's hard to argue that it, it isn't crucial for our survival in many, many ways, mm -hmm. you know, for periods of time, you know, especially when you're young, when you're a kid, actually going through these traumatic experiences, um, you know, they're just overwhelming. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and we need that capacity to, to, to dull the pain, mm -hmm. you know, um, so that we can just survive. Right. Right. Um, and, <clears throat> but, as you said, you know, it's an adaptation that is necessary at, at one part of your, in one part of your life um, that then becomes increasingly constrictive mm -hmm. um, and, and, con and increasingly a uh, um, problem, right. you know, and that's very, very common. What you described, you know, that, that numbing um, is, it's, it's the closest thing to a universal amongst especially child trauma survivors. Right. Um, for, and for, I think, very obvious reasons, because mm -hmm. you're a kid that, you know, you, there's no way you can, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to do what each of you has already demonstrated here this, you know, this morning mm -hmm. is, you know, you know, being able to, you know, sort of both experience something inside yourself and also remain conscious mm. of the, the you that is experiencing it. Right. And, right. and to be able to, you know, sort of see and, and understand yourself that way. That's a product of your age and your product of all the work that each of you have done, um, you know, in response to your, your traumas. And that was, none of that was available to you, right. you know, when you were kids. Um, so, it, it's a it's a transition that so many of us survivors have to go through, mm -hmm. uh, and and in, unfortunately, um, it, it it it's hard hard to to open up yourself to intense feeling w without first confronting the pain that you were you know never able to to experience yeah, right. because it was so overwhelming um, and. But that is so much like grief, mm. you know. I <clears throat> I love my son, I love my wife so deeply that for years it scared me, mm. just scared me, because it felt like, what are you doing? 
you are opening yourself up to such pain. Mm. And, but that's the, that's the, the price of human life, right. mm -hmm. you know, living as a human being right. is it, you know, so there is that equation. I mean, if you're not going to experience the pain, then you're not going to be able to experience the joy of that deep connection. Yeah. And I, I experienced the numbness myself. Um, you just get numb to life and you don't, you're not able to experience joy. You're not able to experience sadness or anger. And I'm still working on that. That's still a work in progress with that. Like just getting angry at your abuser or getting angry about the abuse is, I think that might be strange for other people to, to, to understand, but it's, you're cut off from all, all the emotions. And I'm still, you know, I, I still want, I would be excited if I felt like extreme anger, you know, I'm like waiting for that's a healthy, it's a healthy emotion to have, you know? So I'm almost working towards that feeling. I want to feel that. Right. So you get numbed out and then, you know, part of the transition for healing is then feeling all these emotions and then figuring out how to deal with feeling all these emotions because you've been mm -hmm. numbing yourself for so long. It can be, you know, drugs or work or sex or whatever it is to sort of distract yourself. Yeah. Right. Well, and, you know, there's the added layer to this, too, is is um, for most of us survivors, the <clears throat> all this work is taking place now when we're, in, you know, some some part of adulthood, right. young adulthood, middle adulthood, sometimes later. And at that point, you know, most of us have various kinds of relationships, mm. friendships, intimate relationships. And, and, you know, the, the, this um, transition has a lot of consequences for those relationships. You know, people are used to who you are. Yeah, right. And, and all of a sudden, you are, you know, a little bit different, mm. you know. Um, and you're, you're now starting to, to have these bursts of, of intense feeling, um, whether it's grief, whether it's rage, um, and, yeah. and it can be very destabilizing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It can be tough because you don't want to suppress it. Like if I'm feeling anger about something, I immediately go into like feeling bad. I'm feeling angry and trying to shut it down rather than going, it's okay to be angry, but I'm, I'm figuring out how to express that. And you have, you know, your wife there who's like, why are you, why are you lashing out? I'm not lashing out at her. I'm just trying to express anger because I haven't been able to express it before. And I'm, I'm sort of playing with that. Like what is a healthy way for me to express it and then process it. And then when I react to it, have that reaction be healthy. You know, you don't want to be destructive with that emotion, but you still need to feel it. So I, I work on that as well as like not shutting down when I do feel angry about something or putting myself down for feeling that anger because that's normal, but I'm just not used to, to experiencing that and having that be okay. Well, and this is why, you know, if, if as a survivor, you, you are going through this process at a time when you are in, you know, it, it, and I was going to, you know, intimate relationships, or, but even your friendships, that it's important that, you know, essentially they have to be included in, in the sort of the conscious process that, that needs to be going on in your, in your heart and your head. So it's it, you. You can't just do it alone, because um, it's actually pretty important to hold on to your friendships and and your intimate relationships. Um, but they then have to become part of this. They have to understand what's going on in you. They have to understand what you're trying to accomplish, um, and you know they they need the perspective too. For all of us survivors who have gone through abuse, it's like the abuse happened in isolation, most likely right? That was the way it was able to happen. And then we tend to be in isolation after, you know, post the abuse, um, whether we're consciously keeping it a secret, or we've like, you know, had to, our consciousness and our nervous system has had to repress it in some way to be able to survive, but it's such an isolating experience. And then it can be so easy to carry that now long term behavior of dealing with everything in isolation into one's healing process. Oh, now I have to do this by myself as well. Right. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah.
that's definitely something I've had to fight against as well. Like, no, I, I do. I'm a one man show. I can handle everything. I do everything myself. Right. Um, yeah. Right. And that's really, that's a, um, that's just a replay. Right. You know? Um, and, and the truth of it is, is, is when you fight through that impulse to isolate and you actually take on some of this in partnership with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it could be, you know, a spouse, it could be just a good friend, whatever, whoever it is, another human being, there's a big dividend. To yeah. that, you know, because, you know, we haven't used the word, mentioned the word trust that much mm. here, but, you know, that's, that's a big casualty for right. most of us is, you know, ability to trust another person. And so any experience where you can get through that isolation, you know, that need for isolation and do some part of this in connection with another human being is it's a very that itself that's a very healing sort of mix and um and, and I, I treasure those yeah. david do you feel like along this same line as far as this you know misconceptions about what healing may or may not need to look like or what it is along that same line do you feel like that there's often pressure for survivors to heal in a certain amount of time Right, like, or you went and saw your therapist, right? So you're you're good now, yeah? <laughs> Are we done here? Right. Yeah, and, and you know, th th this is not only true for, you know, healing from from trauma. Um, it's really true about grief in general. And every person has their own internal clock for how long you will tolerate grief <laughs> in yourself or in somebody else. Um, when in fact, obviously, um, this is a completely individual thing. But we and, and this again, our our mental health establishment um, very often um, prematurely diagnoses grief as depression, hmm. Hmm. Um, because you know somebody who's going through grief, a, a lot of it can look like depression. Hmm. Is there a way, how would you describe the difference or different, some of the differences between grief and depression? You know, what I'm going to say is by, by necessity is a, is a sort of a generalization. Um, so, and, and there are many different particulars. Um, one of the differences, I think major differences between depression and grief is, um, you know, Depression is 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 really a shutting down, um, and if you 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 know many of the ways that we diagnose depression are are through um, essentially identifying vegetative symptoms. Um, so you know people just slow down; they lose interest; uh, they become less active; um, they stop doing things that they used to do that you know were were fulfilling or pleasurable. They just have no energy. Um, now, people who are grieving, sometimes at a superficial level, may seem like they have some of those same symptoms, but they, in general, they tend to be far less pronounced. Um, part of it is this, that when you're grieving intensely, you're exhausted. If it's important to figure out whether somebody is depressed or grieving, um, it's, it's yeah. important to do a very careful, individualized sort of assessment of that person yeah. and, and, and not to just take, you know, because one of the, one of the symptoms that people uh, um, sort of assess in their, when they're assessing whether somebody is depressed is, are you crying a lot? You find yourself crying a lot. Mm. And because, yeah, depressed people sometimes cry a lot. Um, but mm -hmm. that that can also be grief. So you, you want to be very right. careful about just, oh, they're crying, must be depression. You know, so nothing really can replace careful, intelligent assessment. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's one of the things as a psychologist that I I grieve the loss of that 
you know, I was trained in clinical psychology at a time when there was still a generation of psychologists around who who became psychologists in a very different era. And, you know, 90% of what I learned in graduate school was how to do a very careful, intelligent assessment. And unfortunately, um, at least here in the States, our mental health and our healthcare sort of system has pretty much eliminated that um, because nobody is going to pay you as a psychologist to spend the time you need to spend to really figure out what this individual person sitting in your office, who they are, you know, what is happening to them, what is their history, um, and so that you really get it, and you know, no, th th there's maybe a touch of depression here, but this is mainly grief. Or, you know, here's another possibility. This was grief, and now for various reasons, it is morphing into depression. That's another possibility, mm -hmm. you know, but none of this can be ascertained quickly or easily. It requires right. real time and effort. Do you feel like suppression of grief can often lead to depression? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's, and you know, that, that is very similar to what we were talking about earlier with this, the, the numbing you know, post-trauma numbing. Um, it's really fundamentally the same thing. Um, and um, and there's also, and it, you know, your comment actually raises an important point to, to make, which is, um, you know, one of the class of symptoms that is part of the post-traumatic stress and or the PTSD diagnosis are avoidance symptoms. Um, and you know, they just can be very active. You avoid driving past cemeteries. You avoid going, driving past the school where the, you know, the counselor abused you or whatever it is, right? You, you know, it can be physical, but also avoidance or, or I'm avoiding intense emotions. You know, it's, you know, numbing yourself, turning down the, the volume of all of your emotional experience. If that becomes a fixed pattern, um, and if for various reasons, a person never has the resources either around them or within themselves to break out of that avoidance, that that very much can then morph into a long-term depression. Um, right. And in fact, as my experience as a clinician was, you know, I worked mainly with men um, and many of them came into therapy, not of their own volition because they were so numb and chronically depressed for so long that they, they would just never, you know, make a phone call or walk into an office, but they were married and their wives would be, you know, pulling their hair out, you know, for years and finally, you know, literally push them through the door. Um, and, but what I would see sitting in front of me is a chronically depressed person, but Yes, it's chronic depression, but its origins are directly linked back to early trauma um, that was, you know, that this man never got the opportunity, never got the help, never was able to, uh, you know, to do any work with that trauma. And so the avoidance symptoms just calcified essentially into depression. What's up, guys? If you're enjoying From Trauma to Triumph, hit the like button and the subscribe button. Then you can rate and review the podcast on whichever platform you listen to it on. And all of this just helps get the podcast in front of more and more people that need it. Wishing you all continued healing and love, and I hope you enjoy the episode. You know, some people might feel a stigma associated with taking medication as part of the recovery process. Um, so I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Sometimes people can also feel they want to get off medication as soon as they start feeling good. Um, so 
can you heal while taking medication? Do people need to get off of it? Um, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, yeah, the, the only, um, I think accurate thing I can say is, uh, all of the above basically, um, you know, medication is just a tool. Um, you know, so I'll start with when can medication be a problem? Well, um, over medication can certainly be a problem um, because, uh, you know, it can essentially function essentially like numbing does. Um, and so if a person is medicated to the point where they really don't feel a lot, you know, um, it's hard to do any kind of, uh, of therapeutic work. Um, so over medication could be a problem. Um, a an over reliance on medication could be a problem um, because one of the things, and this I think harkens back to our earlier discussion about healing. What we're really striving for in in therapy and treatment is to build within this traumatized person the capacity to work with the trauma, to to experience the the painful things to open themselves up through that to experiencing intense positive things, um, basically to become fully human. That's what we're trying mm -hmm. to do um, so that they can right. grieve, so that they can feel joy in all of these things. And, you know, medication can be an effective adjunct to this process so long as it is used wisely and you know with, again with care you know um so um and 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 hopefully in conjunction with um taking on the trauma you know mm. in, in a in a more human way <laughs> not just with medication so you know look if, if somebody comes in to your office and they they've been depressed for for three decades um, mm. you're probably not going to be able to do any kind of meaningful work with them until you can get them out of that deep depressive state. Mm. So mm. medication would be crucial in that context. Mm. If somebody gets so um, anxious, um, you know, to the point of having, you know, panic attacks and so forth, when they're confronting intense feeling, you know, or scary things, you know, that lurk in their, their, their memories and so forth, that, that work won't be tenable. Right. Yeah. So mm -hmm. medication to damp down, not eliminate the anxiety, but damp it down. Mm -hmm. So it's manageable so that they can sit in the office and, and actually experience the, the painful feelings you know, without becoming overwhelmed. So that's the use, that's the, 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 the role of medication. Mm. Um, so there's right. no reason to yeah. be, you know, sort of just categorically afraid of it or against it. It's just a tool, but like all tools, I mean, you can pick up a hammer and smash your fingers, but you can also hammer a nail down into woods. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with medication. I think, yeah, I think that's a great distinction because especially you know, for me, when I first started, my symptoms were so acute. I was just so, so extreme and the anxiety and depression that you needed to curb that down a little bit to, so that you're able to start feeling a bit where you're able to start feeling and work on those feelings. So it's not, it's not annihilating all feeling altogether, right? It, it's, it's really that balance where it takes you down a little bit so that you can deal with it. And then slowly, as you learn to deal with your emotions, if, if it works, you can get off the medication. Some people, you know, might need to, might need to stay on, but it's not removing feelings. It's, it's, it's bringing it down a bit so that you can then deal with the feelings. Cause at first they they can be so extreme, you know, you're just not in any kind of place to, to work on the trauma. Right. And of course, you know, the, let's remember that the, the sort of the assumption behind what you just said is that, you know, you are trying to work on the trauma, you know. Right. So, yeah. you know, that's why medication alone, um, I mean, it can still be, 
useful because, you know, the person can get up out of bed and go to work or whatever, you know, if, if it's mm -hmm. depression they're being treated or, or the, you know, the anxiety isn't crippling them so that they, they can't leave their house. Um, mm -hmm. But um, if we're talking about trauma and healing from trauma, then, um, you know, medication by itself is unlikely to accomplish that. Mm -hmm. it's, it's medication yeah. and the tool is a tool to make it possible uh, to work. And, you know, and I don't want to say working, it doesn't necessarily have to be a therapist. You know, there are plenty of people mm. who work through traumas, um, you know, in their relationships with, with, you know, rabbis and ministers and pastors. Um, you know, there are all kinds of mm. ways in groups, in, in peer support groups. Um, mm. So, yeah. you know, but, you know, therapy obviously is a very intensive form of this. Um, but we have to be realistic. A lot of people can't afford it. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, that's exactly a question we wanted to ask. And kind of that two part question is maybe one part is in what ways it being your expertise and your experience, do you feel that, you know, why, why is therapy helpful? Right. I know it's a big question. Um, but, and then part two, as you just said, for, for many people who don't have access to therapy, you know, any other suggestions that you have or feelings about how people can move towards their healing, even though they may not have access to a therapist. Well, so I, I'm going to add one more wrinkle into that is, um, yeah. um, finding a, a, a good therapist can be quite mm -hmm. a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and, and especially for male survivors, you know, mm -hmm. um, we have in the United States and Canada, there's a, a fairly large cadre of mental health professionals who now are, quite familiar with trauma, with some of the basic concepts of trauma and, and, and different treatment approaches. Um, and that's all good. It's in, in, in really good. But, you know, working with male survivors is, is uh, a significant subcategory within that. Um, and there are certainly, you know, unique challenges and unique issues that males, you know, sort of face and, 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 unique ways in which things manifest themselves in, in men. Um, and it's really helpful to know that and to know about that. Um, right. and, and so we have very, very few, you know, compared to the number of men who need this, we have very few right. mm. um, professionals who are really trained. Um, and that's one of the things that obviously many of us are engaged in, in you know, trying to increase the, uh, the number of, of you know, trained professionals that are out there. Now, mm. fortunately, you know, therapy is, well, therapy can be a very intensive uh, way of, of helping somebody heal. Um, so I have had three experiences in my life of very good therapy, very helpful therapy. Um, and you know, it's impossible for me to say where I would be now had I not had those experiences. But, um, you know, I can say quite with a fair amount of certainty that um, I'm, I'm here at least in part because of them. Um, mm -hmm. So um, it, it's I, I, it's unfortunate that uh, th therapy is so costly that. Uh, yeah. Frankly, most people just simply can't access it. The, the, the good thing is that healing is much more complicated than just working to eliminate symptoms. And, mm -hmm. and people heal profoundly from just reconnecting with other human beings. Mm -hmm and reconnecting so that they can trust other people. Um, and so the number of men uh, that I have talked to, interviewed formally or informally over the years, who have healed more profoundly from close, intimate relationships um, mm -hmm. exceeds the number that have been healed by therapy. One of the 
what the, the, the challenges there is that um, trusting another human being enough to become really open and vulnerable with them is one of the things say, that we all... <laughs> there's a bit of a catch-22 because if you don't go to therapy, you might not be able to have connections with other people. And, that, and those connections is what, you know, ultimately is, is could possibly be the best healing. But if you, if you're not able to make those connections, then, um, then you're kind of stuck. And our, our trauma can be, can become such a burden on someone else. Right. Um, but that's such a, you don't want to, you don't want to hold back because of that. Cause then you're in the same boat that you've been in, right. Of this numbing, um, uh, you know, it's such a, as you know, such a complicated, intense, <laughs> heavy issue. That's so hard for other people who maybe one on one side, maybe don't have any experience with that sort of thing, or maybe they have, and they're not ready to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. It's so hard for someone else to hold space for that. Yeah. Um, part of my uh, early youth, I went to ag school and worked on farms for many years. The farms I worked on were all pretty classic small family farms. And, and even then, they survived. If they were still around, they survived because they followed the, the adage of, of family farming, which is mm. don't put your eggs all in one basket. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing is true here, what we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. So you're, you're, you're absolutely right that, you know, as survivors, we are going to go through periods in our life where we are working so intensely on things and it's so self-absorbing and it has to be, you know, mm -hmm. so much of our energy is going into this. It's like all we can think about. It's, it just won't mm -hmm. let us alone, mm -hmm. you know, and that's a lot to ask of a partner. You know, right. you know, they're going to get exhausted at some point. So, right. you know, that's why peer support groups mm. can be so important. And and I think that's, you know, actually the, the medium that we are using right here um, is an amazing uh, sort of opportunity for us because um, we, we can do a lot of this virtually, you know. Right. Um, and. Um, so, you know, peer support, you know, reading books, writing in a journal, um, you, you know, there's, a, there's all kinds of things that you can build you know, into your healing, you know, sort of journey um, so that you're, you're, you're not, you know, relying solely on this one person in your life. Uh, to be, you know, your witness and your partner and your conversation, you know, sort of. Um, yeah so that there's a little bit of a dispersion <laughs> of, yeah. you know, of what you need. If I could just second that endorsement for a moment, like support groups have been such a huge component of my healing journey and, and speaking to that piece that I even brought up about a certain amount of people either, you know, aren't ready, don't understand, or aren't capable of holding, you know, or understanding what it is that, 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 that we are going through in the healing journey for me to then be in this space with all survivors and survivors of, of different kinds of abuse. Um, and for one of the first, for my first time in my life with this issue, feeling like, Oh, I don't have to explain myself to these people. They get it. Like, you know, just by the simple thing of when I'm saying this thing that I thought I was the only one who thinks this kind of crazy thought or has this kind of scary feeling, that seeing the, the resonance in all of them around me and the knowingness and the nodding of their head, and how much relief that gave me, you know, it was just instrumental. Yeah. 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 And I, I wish for every survivor that experience. Mm. Right. Yeah. It's an incredible relief. So you talked earlier about um, your experience with one in six you also have another project with one and six, which is the bristlecone project, which I, which I believe you started on your own and then carried over to one and six where male survivors um, speak on camera and speak about their abuse. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Working 
in this realm with male survivors. Um, yeah, I started, you know, I guess in the 1980s. Back then, you know, there was a whole literature on childhood sexual abuse focused on kids. You know, so they, you know, researchers would, you know, get a sample of, of children, uh, like from social services records or something like that. And, and so basically that literature studying children who had just been abused, like, so they're still children. If you look at that literature, you find that when it comes to sexual abuse, um, there, every sample has a certain number of girls and a certain number of boys. And very often, essentially 50-50. If you then looked at the literature on adults who had been sexually abused, and there was a separate literature, right? Mm -hmm. So these are now adults, and, and you're looking at, you know, do they have higher rates of, you know, psychiatric illness, higher rates of these kinds of symptoms, and so forth. That literature was exclusively women. Mm. So literally, all those boys who were sexually abused disappeared. Mm. Like they didn't exist. Right. So why? And, you know, why is complicated, but it's, it's certainly it's a, a, a collective thing, a collusion. Um, you know, we, we have cultural... Uh, sort of images of masculinity and men that are imposed on us as boys. The consequence is that men grow up having had these experiences as, as children, and they, they, they just internalize that disappearance. Um, so you find out that, you know, like I early on, I started doing research to try to find out, well, you know, what percentage of men have experienced sexual abuse of different kinds, types, and discovered very quickly that it's almost impossible to find out mm -hmm. because you can offer them anonymity and they still won't tell you. Yeah. Um, and so it became painfully obvious, and of course I'd experienced it myself, that there is this stigma surrounding being a man and having suffered sexual abuse. Mm. And that stigma is so profound, it's so intense, it's so universal that it absolutely silences men who have experienced it and isolates them. Yeah. And so, you know, they become essentially partners in, um, in, in becoming invisible. Mm. So why bristlecone? Well, you know, I decided, you know, the stigma has to be challenged. And, you know, I felt like the only way it's going to be challenged is if some of us survivors are willing to tell our stories with our full names, not initials, full names and our photographs. And the photographer in me knew instinctively, immediately, that every single portrait, the guy's got to be looking right into the camera lens mm. so that when somebody looks at that portrait, it doesn't matter where they are in the room, they are making eye contact. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, so I came up with that idea and I, you know, I, I thought maybe they'll, I'll find six guys willing to do it. I actually found eight guys who were willing to do it, all of them colleagues, friends. Mm -hmm. And we went live with the website in uh, May of 2013. And, uh, and then I found out that I was wrong. Um, I, I started getting emails from guys almost immediately. Mm. By the end of the first year, we had 20, some 22 guys on the website. Wow. And it, it just uh, kept going and, and, and increasing uh, year after year. There are now about 140 guys on the website and uh, over 100 guys on the waiting list all over, actually all over the world now. Oh, the, the, the project is so beautiful. I've, I've seen several 
of the videos. Um, and just so powerful and so simple in its setup, right? Um, where just these, these men are allowed to just be however they are in their story and tell it however it's naturally coming forward. And um, yeah, and you, still even now, like when I look at it and I've had a particular experience being the last, you know, one, of course, being a survivor myself in the last eight, nine years, being, you know, relatively entrenched in the survivor community. And still, even for me, when I see those videos, I'm, it's so powerful to, to see another man yeah. being that vulnerable and talking about that story. So honestly, yeah. you know, yeah. it just waterworks for me, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many of those men who are on the website, you know, at some point express their sense that, you know, they are, they don't measure up as a man. Mm. Mm. They don't have the strength. They don't have the courage. They don't have, you know, they feel weak. They feel like, and I sit there looking at them because I've been witnessing an expression, a manifestation of such courage, the courage to reveal your vulnerability in the service of other men, yeah. because that's why people do this. That's why men do this, mm. yeah. because they know that other men need to see this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and I can't tell you how many times I have with tears in my eyes pleaded with them. <laughs> Each man, to see yourself the way I see you mm. right now. Yeah. Mm. And please take that in. Right. Um, right. It, it's been an amazing experience to, you know, wow. to be the witness for, for so many men. So where, where can people find that project and see the videos? It's uh, the Bristlecone project is now integrated with one and six, and we're actually going to be integrating it even more fully in the coming months. Um, but it is part of the, the one and six website. Um, uh, I think it's uh, stories of survivors or survivor stories, and you can see it on the first landing page of one and six. Um, and you can get into the sort of the Bristlecone part of the website. There are also instructions any man who, who any survivor who wants to participate um, can also um, um, go through either the one in six website or my own email address. And, um, uh, and it's still um, a very sort of individual, personal thing. Um, I, um, I'm the landing spot for uh, any man who is thinking about participating. Uh, and so I, I have had lengthy email conversations with men uh, actually all over the world um, who um, are, are thinking about it or deciding they want to. Well, thank you, David, for doing that work. It's such a service. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, as I said, it, it's been an, an incredible experience for me. So it's been very much two way. <laughs> you know, if, if you wanted to speak to any, um, challenges or particulars that seem to be different between the male and female survivors. We definitely spoke about, you know, particular challenges for males. And I don't know if you feel compelled or have something you feel like you'd want to say about comparing and contrasting at all, or if that for the female side of the equation. Yeah. I, I think one of the, 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 the challenges is, and, and it, 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 there, it's sort of like a mirror, mirror image of what many, women have to work through who are survivors of childhood sexual abuses, you know, they're faced with, you know, how, how do I grow up in, into being a, a woman, you know, because there are, of course, there, there, there are as many messages that women internalize uh, from the culture about, you know, what is, what is femininity, what it is, it is to be feminine, what it is to, you know, um, and there are also, you know, messages about sexuality and so all these kinds of things that a woman has to navigate um, now with the, you know, the, the overwhelming baggage of having experienced sexual abuse during childhood. And so for men, 
probably one of the most common struggles that I have witnessed in, in so many male survivors is this feeling of being branded as um, I don't measure up. I, you know, I can't, I'll never be a real man. And that's why it's so poignant for me when I'm sitting, you know, doing a, a bristlecone interview and I really, you know, I'm just witnessing this unbelievable act of courage and selflessness. And yet still, you know, mm. I, I don't measure They up, don't see it. You know, you know, some survivors, I think many of us maybe, you know, go through a period where we're going to, we're going to prove that we're actually men, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So we, we kind of delve into sort of hyper-masculinity a little bit. So, you know, yeah, if I can build that facade then you know, people will really see me as one of them. I'm like one of the guys and I'm, I, you know, I do measure up, you know? Um, yeah. And, right. and I see that, of course, you know, I do forensic work. I've been doing forensic work for years and in prisons, you know, I can't tell you how many guys I sit down with this guy. I do death penalty work, so they're all on death row. And the message is tattooed all over them. Basically, the message is, you know, I'm a man. Fuck you. Right. I literally had one guy, this guy in Arkansas, who tattooed fuck you on his forehead. You know. So it's it's just painted on their bodies. I'm tough, you know. And every single one of them is a childhood sexual abuse survivor. Um, wow. So, you know, so for men, you know, we have to grapple with this whole masculinity thing, and um, and and, and it's tough, and it, and it kind of melds with, you know, the sexual abuse often, you know, leaves us feeling worthless. Because uh, we internalize the abuse, we internalize how the abuser, you know, sort of used us, um, mm. and um, and and that can be a real hard one. And and of course, you know, one of the big, big, big problems with you know masculinity, and especially hypermasculinity, is you know <laughs> some of the things that go along with it. You don't ask for help. Hell, you don't even ask for help with directions. Mm, right. You sure as heck don't mm, ask right, for right. help with. Yeah, I got this real big psychological issue. Can you help me? I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. that, that doesn't happen in Hollywood often, you know, maybe a little bit more nowadays. Yeah, but, right. Um, so you don't ask for help. Um, and, you, you know, what, what are the emotions that men are kind of allowed stereotypically to express? Well, anger. You can be angry. And actually, sometimes not even so much anger as yeah. aggression, you know. Right. Um, right. Yeah. But vulnerability? No, not really. Um, mm -hmm. You know, grief? Not really. Um, so, you know, with those kinds of constraints, it, it's kind of blocking systematically all the roots toward healing that we've been talking about here. Connecting yeah. with another human being, yeah. being vulnerable with that person, you know, um, you know seeking help. <laughs> Going into your room yeah, with right. other men and being vulnerable mm -hmm. just by, of course, if, if if it's a peer support group for male survivors and you walk in the room and what have you just disclosed, you know? Mm -hmm. um, right. And for right. some men, that's a bridge too far. And I feel like it's also, especially with male sexual abuse survivors, that there can also be this kind of toxic... Um, idea for men in general to also, you know, the idea of a man is also to be sexually dominant, right? And proficient. And then you've had this, you know, situation as a child or at any point um, where you were not dominant and you were abused, you were betrayed, right? You were a victim, yeah, sexually. Mm. Right. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a sense of just how profound that is. So for 30 some years, I've been evaluating men on death row. Um, I'm hired by their defense attorneys uh, to because they either know or suspect that they were sexually abused as kids. And this is what's called mitigation evidence that should have been presented to a jury. You know, the jury is 
should know that that happened to them so that they can weigh whether or not they show mercy towards this guy. Um, mm. So that's what I've been doing for 30 some years. And what I learned quite early on that I had to do in order to get as, as much disclosure as is possible from these men um, is um, as part of my introduction, you know, I would say to them, look, um, I, I, I really need you to be honest with me. Um, and if, if there's something you tell me that you don't want to leave this room, um, I will respect that. And I won't, I won't tell your attorneys. I won't tell anybody. It's just between you and me in this room. Um, and if you tell me something and then you change your mind, I could be walking out the door and you can say, you know what? I, I don't want you to tell me, tell the lawyers that I will not tell the lawyers that now, mm. you know, 90% of the time, um, they, they disclose and, and they decide it's okay to tell the lawyers, but a number of times they have told me this is between you and me only, mm. and you know what that means? That means that they are foregoing something that might well save their lives. Right. That's how intense that stigma is. I'd rather die. Yeah. Right. My gosh. That's a, it brings, you know, it brings another thing to mind is just how important it is to deal with this abuse and to talk about it because it's really a matter of life and death. And so many men and women too, I would imagine kill themselves with this for not, because they're not dealing with this abuse and it either takes your life. Literally either you take your life or you're, you live a life that's not full or what, you know, you're not being the person you could be. You know, when people say, why are you speaking out? Why are you? It's because it's a matter of life and death. Yeah. It really is. It's so important to, if you can, to speak out. You, know, you don't have to, but if you're not speaking out to deal with the abuse yeah. yourself, like to, to try to deal with it personally. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, quite literally, there, there's actually for a good, fair amount of research on um, the frequency of suicide among um, you know, particularly men. Um, suicide rates for men uh, who, are, who have a history of childhood sexual abuse are... are much, much higher, significantly higher than, you know, general population. One of the things that um, we often get to in, in, in the Bristlecone interviews is, um, you know, because the topic almost always comes up, you know, sort of, why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I'm putting my full name and my photograph and my story right. and the videotape, you know, when people literally just Google my name, they're going to land on there. They're going to see this. Right. And pretty much every time we get to that point, you know, I, I have to, I, I, I don't want to in any way coerce or even push a guy who, you know, right. has, any kind of qualms, any kind of, and I've had men who we've gone through the whole interview and they just said, you know what? I can't do this. I can't do this. Mm -hmm. Number two. Um, but who's, whose shame is it? Mm -hmm. Why, why is it my shame or your shame? Right. So why, why am I carrying it? Why shouldn't I put my face and my name on? This is what was done to me. Right. I have borne the consequences of it. So why should I feel ashamed? Yeah. Yeah. That's why we look into the camera lens. Because it's... Right. right. No fucking way anymore. You know, that also speaks to when this, the childhood sexual abuse, it's not just physical abuse, it's mental abuse as well. So your abuser, I think, 
tells you it's your fault or tells you you did this. They, they shoulder that on you. Yeah. They put that on you and then they take off. Right. And you're just left as a child with all of that, either responsibility for the abuse and you just carry that on. Well, you know, look, I, I, I've studied perpetrators, you know, my entire career and, and, um, this is just part of it. So it's almost like the most constant thing in the playbook is you mm. instill in the child um, a, a profound sense of complicity. Um, and sometimes, as you say, it's, it's not just, well, you, you colluded with me or whatever. You also wanted it. It was, no, 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 no. I was responding mm -hmm. to you. Right. This was your idea. It was, yes, it was your idea, you know. Um, mm -hmm. and there's just a million ways in which this is, and it's all done deliberately. This is not an accident mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. a child who feels like they were complicit is a child who's silenced. Yeah. yeah. How does, if, right. if a child believes right to the core of their being that they're complicit in this, how the hell are they going to say a word to anybody? Right. Right. They're, they'd be literally admit confessing to to a just horrific unimaginable crime and, and then you add to that even before that act of creating a sense of complicity or uh, or guilt is perpetrated by the perpetrator there can already there's this societal belief that like well adults you know respect your elders right the adults know what's best they're right children are wrong Children are to be, you know, seen and not heard, and all of that. Right. It's 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 essentially in our DNA. It, children internalize how they're treated. So, mm -hmm. if you take this out of the realm for a moment, out of the realm of sexual abuse, um, I, I've also dealt a lot with physical abuse in my career. And, um, you know, when a child is is beaten, um, you know. In, in the, the cases that we call physical abuse, this is not, you know, punishment that's a, a little bit too exuberant. You know, physical abuse is is essentially uh, has a lot of similarities with sexual abuse, because really what the adult, the physically abusing uh, caretaker is doing is is using the child's body um, for their gratification. And, and in this case, in physical abuse, you know, the adult either was themselves abused, and so now they're just turning all that anger and rage uh, against the child who's vulnerable, like they were vulnerable. Um, you know, it's just a, a, an outlet for their aggression and their frustration and rage. And you can get at this because when you, you talk to somebody who suffered physical abuse, even years, years later, ask them to stop for a moment and remember what their abuser's face looked like. Mm. And I guarantee you, you will be chilled to the bone by what you hear. Mm. In an, an, an example of variations of this, whether it's their mother or their father, um, it's like they were no longer there. Mm. And I was just something they were beating on. And, right. hmm. and that is the deepest legacy of physical abuse, because what they internalize from that is, I am just a piece of shit. Hmm. I'm just something that other people use as a punching bag. And so they, right. they, they go off into life feeling like that's who they are. Children internalize the way they're treated. And, and so both physical and sexual abuse um, the child is, even without the perpetrator overtly instilling a sense of complicity, um, that child is going to feel complicit because if it's something bad that's happening, somehow they are responsible for it. Just to kind of expand or double down on that thought, I mean, it was something I wanted to ask anyway. So we've mentioned in that instance, you just mentioned sexual and physical abuse, and, and then we've of course, got mental and emotional or neglectful abuse, you know, in your experience, 
working with people with those different who have experienced those different kinds of abuse do you find that a lot of the symptoms of that abuse tend to be similar or different or yeah a lot of them are similar um mm -hmm. the, the the sexual abuse um often has some additional dimensions to it uh because of its mm -hmm. effect on sexuality because of its potential effect on sexual identity. Um, and, you know, because the, the there's even more stigma associated with sexual abuse, uh, and particularly mm -hmm. for men. Um, so I think there, there are often additional layers. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, but as I said, there are so many commonalities um, yeah. between especially physical abuse and sexual abuse um yeah that that m much of it is is in common um mm -hmm. and and neglect is you know I, it, it neglect is hard i i encounter it a lot in my forensic work really profound neglect um and it is um it its impact tends to be different but uh, i would say um oftentimes every bit as harmful in what ways are you hopeful for the healing of survivors uh, present day and, and moving forward? And... I actually am very hopeful. Um, and specifically, you know, when I think about where we were um, 30, 35 years ago uh, compared to today, specifically with regard to men, and, and men who've experienced trauma and especially childhood trauma, especially childhood sexual trauma. Um, I, I do see, I mean, the, the, the openness of men, the willingness of more and more men to come forward. And you see this in so many ways. I mean, obviously, you know, bristlecone is one little way in which, you know, men mm -hmm. can demonstrate that willingness, but, you know, increasingly men who are, are, um, challenging the, the Catholic Church and other churches and religions, you know, um, with, with you know, sometimes criminal cases, civil cases more often because of the statute of limitations. Um, 86,000 people, the vast majority of the men, filed complaints against the Boy Scouts. 86,000. Wow. Um, you know, so there are many ways, um, and, and also you see um, celebrities, men who, you know, actors, musicians, politicians, um, yeah. you know, coming forward and disclosing, saying, yeah, this happened to me, part of who I am. Um, right. And, I, you know, I see it in my own little universe, you know, because I'm the, the point of contact for Bristol Cohen volunteers, I also get emails, my email address is right there for people so that they can contact me. And I get emails from survivors, men all over the world, um, the Arab world, India, uh, all over Europe and Africa, um, who visit the Bristlecone website and it's their community because they live in places where there is no openness yet. In fact, it's dangerous to, to disclose what we still have a lot of work to do. Well, we have a lot of work to do in every area, including, you know, this opening up and, and destigmatizing it. But we have a lot of work to do in creating the the opportunities for for healing that that you know many of them we talked about here. Um, you know, availability of of trained therapists who have some familiarity with working with men certainly. Uh, availability of peer support groups, whether virtual or in person, um, you know, and, and, and just information, just, you know, men being willing to just talk openly about this. Um, so many times in my career, I have encountered men, you know, in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, for the first time, asking a question that's been plaguing them for their entire lives. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, so there's still, I mean, we are, we are, I, I guess I, I'd, I'd say we are in a, a, an opening phase that is mm -hmm. very promising, mm -hmm. but we need to capitalize on it and we need to support it and really nurture it. <laughs> so it, it yeah. leads not only to more public conversations, but also to, you know, concrete on the ground services for men um, that are accessible to them. Well, David, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing your personal experiences and, and your professional experiences. Um, just so grateful. And I think it's been so helpful for me. Um, and I believe will be so helpful for our listeners. Well, it's been a pleasure to talk with both of you. It really has. Thanks, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. You too. This is From Trauma to Triumph. Please remember to like, subscribe, and rate on your favorite podcast platform.